All righty. Hello, hello, everybody. We're back. Um, I had to go take my son to work, but we were in the middle of... What's up, Aunt Vicky? Welcome back. Good to see you from yesterday. Uh, so part one of this, I've already... I, I will upload it later to YouTube, but I already have started part one of Can I Be Sure That I'm Saved by R.C. Sprawl. And, um, we have, we, you didn't miss a lot. If you weren't here for the first part, it's okay. Good morning, wild man. Hello, sir. Uh, good to see the both of you guys back. We, um, as we were reading, um, the book points out that there are four types of people out there and everybody falls into one of these types of categories. So I'm going to refresh real quick and tell you uh, the four types of people living in the world. There are, uh, one, there are those who are saved and know it. Number two, there are those who are saved but do not know it. Number three, those, like a man uh, mentioned pre previously, who are unsaved and know it. And those who are unsaved but don't know it. So we've already gone through explaining the three. Um, essentially, what he's breaking down is the fact that um, you can be saved and not have assurance of your salvation and still be saved, right? Um, in fact, uh, I use my own story. Of when I got saved, I was hearing the gospel from the Left Behind series in a book, and I believed on Jesus after hearing the gospel through the books. <clears throat> and, uh, But I didn't know that I was saved. I had no idea that I was saved. I thought there was something else that I needed to do to be saved. Uh, and which is interesting because that's what in scripture, you know, what must I do to be saved? Um, I, when I heard the gospel, I believed on Jesus. I was like, whoa, this is real. I don't know what to do next, but I thank you, Goose, Goosehead, Ohio. I'm from Ohio. Um, but I knew that I needed to go, like, I needed to figure out that salvation. I needed to understand what that meant now that I have this, this sudden realization of who Jesus is. Um, are you from Ohio and Vicki? Wow. Look at us, all of us Ohioans in here. Um, but it wasn't until I had gone to the people that were on, uh, I was in the Navy at the time, um, that were doing Bible studies and stuff like that. It wasn't until I had gone to them to, to get the assurance of my salvation. I, I spoke to my, my pastor at the time I had said to him, uh, he, we had never talked before. He said, did you need to talk to me about something? And the only thing I could think of saying to him was I need to be saved. I need to be saved. <laughs> like, that's all I that's all I knew to say to him. And so um he said, Well, that's great. I can't save you, but let's pray and let's let's go to the Lord in repentance. And that's what I did that day. So I remember very specifically the day that I was saved. Um this book leading up to where we're at now uh also explains that there are lots of people you're from Ohio too, Ray. This is crazy. <laughs> lots of Ohioans in here. O H I O. Um but uh, there are people that um, genuinely just, they, they are saved before they even know it, right? All right, so the final person in this group, and also the part one is going to be uploaded to YouTube, so you can go watch that, uh, you can watch that later. Uh, the final group, the people who are unsaved but don't know it. Uh, here's what we have so far. Those who are saved and know it, those who are saved but do not know it. Uh, those who are unsaved and know it, and those who are, and the final category is those who are unsaved but don't know it. It's the fourth category that throws a monkey wrench into the whole business of assurance of salvation. Those who are unsaved but know they are saved, quote unquote, know they are saved. They are unsaved but they don't know it, right? Um this category consists of people who are not in a state of grace, but think that they are. In short, they have a false assurance. Ligonier Ministries once conducted a, t a tour of Reformation sites following the footsteps of Martin Luther. We went through the various places in which, uh, in what had been Eastern Europe and East Germany, where Luther carried out his ministry. 
We went to Erfurt, Wittenberg, Worms, Nuremberg, and other places. One day we visited a site, and then we were free for lunch on our own. Groups of people from the tour went different directions into our t- into the town, and we had instructions as to the place and time that we were supposed to regroup for the tour. Well, a group of us wandered around the town and had our lunch, but when we came out of the restaurant, we couldn't remember the way that we had come. We had said to each other, how do we get back to the bus? At that point, one woman in our group, ah, women, just kidding, said, I know the way. So she went to the front of the line and started walking through this town. We all followed her. Soon, it was apparent that we weren't going in the right direction. Now, if she was driving, no, I'm just kidding. Just kidding, ladies. Calm down. And I began to get a little worried. So I said, excuse me, Mary, are you sure that we're going the right way? And she said, yes, I'm positive. I felt relieved, but after a couple more steps, she turned around to say, of course, I'm always sure, but I'm rarely right. People who exude confidence that they're on their way to heaven are a bit like that woman. They know, quote unquote, know they are Christians. They are sure of their salvation. It's not something that they worry about. The only problem is their assurance is false assurance. That's what creates the tension and the anxiety that we're trying to deal with in this booklet. Particularly as we compare groups one and four, group one, you'll recall, comprises of people who are saved and have the assurance of their salvation. And group four comprises people who are not saved, but nevertheless have an assurance of salvation. As we consider how Uh, As we consider how we can have real assurance, we need to think more on the root causes of false assurance. What's up, Blue? How can they be saved but not saved and know it? How can they be, how can they be not saved but saved and know it? No, that's not, he's not saying that they're saved. He's not saying that they're not saved and then that they are saved. He's saying that they think that they are saved. They have assurance of their salvation, though they have no salvation. All right. Um, Brittany, take care of those trolls as you, as they come in. They were pretty bad during part one. All right, chapter three in this book by R.C. Sproul. Can I be sure I'm saved? False assurance. Our quest for full assurance of salvation is complicated by the fact that there are two very different categories of people who are sure that they're in a state of salvation. The only problem is that one of them is mistaken. These are the people that Jesus spoke of in the Sermon on the Mount when he said that some will come to him in the last day, saying, Lord, Lord. They will come to Jesus fully assured that they belong to him. But he will turn them away, exposing their assurance as counterfeit. How can false assurance be possible? How do people arrive at a false sense of assurance? In this chapter, I want to try to answer these questions. There are several different problems, but they basically reduce to two. The first problem, which will be our focus in this chapter, is a faulty understanding of the requirements for salvation. People can misunderstand what salvation entails. We'll look at three of the main errors. Number one, universalism. Number two, legalism. And three, various forms of sacerdotalism. The second problem arises when a person has a correct understanding of what salvation entails, but is mistaken as to whether he or she has met the requirements. The final two chapters will help us to see that we can accurately evaluate whether we have met the requirements for salvation. Number one, universalism. Boy, I see this a lot on TikTok. I'm baptized, but my grandsons are not. Yeah, it's okay. Baptism doesn't save. The first major error that leads to a false sense of assurance of salvation is universalism. Universalism teaches that everyone is saved and goes to heaven. If a person is convinced of this doctrine of salvation, a simple syllogism will take him from the doctrine of universal salvation uh, to assurance as to his destiny. Premise number one, every person goes to heaven. Premise number two, I am a person. Conclusion, therefore I will go to heaven. The greatest controversy in the history of the church took place in the 16th century between the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant reformers over the question of how justification takes place. The issue was whether justification is by is faith alone or by some other means. 
But today, justification by faith alone is not the prevailing view in our culture. Rather, it is the doctrine of justification by death, and universalism carries this idea with it. I made a brief reference earlier to the first evangelism explosion diagnostic question, which is, how uh, have you come to the place in your spiritual life where you know for sure that if you were going to die, that you would go to heaven? The second diagnostic question is this, if you were to die tonight and stand before God, and God were to say to you, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? Once, when my son was young, I asked him these two questions. I was delighted that he immediately answered the first question by saying yes. But when I asked him the second question, he looked at me as if I had just posed the silliest question that he had ever heard. He said, well, I would say because I'm dead. (laughs) What could be simpler? My son was being reared in a home committed to biblical theology. But not only had I failed to communicate justification by faith alone to him, He already had been captured by the pervasive view in our culture that everyone goes to heaven and that all you have to do to get there is to die. We have so eliminated the last judgment from our theology and expunged any notion of divine punishment or hell from our thinking. What? Okay. Or any... uh, expunge any notion of divine punishment or hell from our thinking and from the church's thinking that it is now widely assumed that all a person must do to get to heaven is to die. In fact, the most powerful means of grace for sanctification in our culture is to die because a sin blistered sinner is automatically transformed between the morgue and the cemetery so that when the funeral service is held, the person is presented as a paragon of virtue. His sins seem to be have removed by his death. This is very dangerous business because the scriptures warn us that, that, that it is appointed for every person once to die, then to face judgment. Hebrews 9.27 People like to think that the threat of a last judgment was invented by fire and brimstone evangelists such as Billy Sunday, Dwight L. Moody, Billy Graham, Jonathan Edwards, and George Whitfield, But no one taught more clearly about the last judgment and a division between heaven and hell than Jesus himself. In fact, Jesus talked more about hell than he did about heaven. And he warned his hearers that on the last day, every idle word would come into judgment. But if there's anything unredeemed human beings want to repress psychologically, It's the threat of final comprehensive judgment because none of them wants to be held accountable for their sin. Therefore, nothing is more appealing to human beings than universalism, the idea that we are all saved. The next one is legalism. The second major error that leads to false assurance is legalism, which is another way of referring to works of righteousness. Legalism teaches that in order to get to heaven, you must obey the law of God and live a good life. In other words, your good deeds will get you into heaven. Many people mistakenly understand what God requires because they have met the standards God has set for entrance into heaven. Hey guys, real quick too, I just want to let you know, I do plan to answer lots of questions. I see lots of comments coming through. I do want to answer your questions, but I also want to read through this study before I get to that. So we'll do that at the end. You can save your questions. If you have questions for me, save those to the end. Uh, You guys can continue to speak amongst yourselves in the chat. Obviously, I'm just not able to read those. Uh, And then one final thing is if you guys would just tap your phone screen and just up the likes a little bit, it brings more people into the chat. Uh, and, and, you know, prayerfully somebody comes in that needs to hear about the assurance of their salvation. I'm not asking for gifts. Likes are real easy. It's just a little tap tap on the screen. You don't have to send me anything. I'm not asking for anything like that. But I do appreciate the likes because that will boost the algorithm to, to bring more people in here. And that's all I ask of you. Other than that, be a listening ear uh, and uh, ask your questions at the end. And I love you. Just a little 15-minute break at work. What's up? Hey, what's up, brother? How are you? We're talking about assurance of salvation and how important it is as a believer to have assurance in what God has done 
in work in you. All right, number two, legalism. The second major error that leads to false assurance is legalism, which is another way of referring to works of righteousness. All right, we talked about that. Um, in other words, good deeds. So I once served as a trainer for evangelism explosion, taking trainees out into the community once or twice a week, talking to people and asking the diagnostic questions. Afterward, we correlated the answers that we received. 90% of the answers fell into the category of works righteousness. When we ask people what they would say if God were to ask them why he should let them into heaven, most people replied, I've lived a good life. I gave a tithe to the church, or I worked with the Boy Scouts, or something along those lines. Their confidence rested on some kind of performance record that they had achieved. Unfortunately, a person's works are a counterfeit basis for assurance. The scriptures make very clear that no one is justified by the works of the law. See Romans 3.20 and Galatians 3.11. The person who perhaps most embodied this false understanding of salvation was the rich young ruler who encountered Jesus during his earthly ministry, Luke 18, 18 through 30. You may recall that when the rich man came to Jesus, he had compliments dripping from his lips. He said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He was asking Jesus what was required for salvation. Before Jesus answered his question about the requirements for salvation, he dealt with the compliment. Jesus asked, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. That's verse 19. Some critics hold that, by virtue of this response, Jesus was denying his goodness and deity. No, Jesus knew very well that this man did not have a clue about the person to whom he was speaking. This man didn't know who Jesus was. He didn't know he was asking the question of God incarnate. All the rich young ruler knew was that he was talking to an itinerant rabbi, itinerant rabbi, and he wanted an answer to a theological question. But Jesus's identity was central to the answer. So Jesus said, "Why do you call me good? Haven't you read Psalms Psalm 14:3? They have all turned aside; together they have become corrupt." There is none who does good, not even one. No one is good except God himself. Does that seem absurd? After all, we see people who aren't believers doing good all the time. It all depends on what we mean by good. The Bible, the biblical standard of goodness is the righteousness of God. And we are judged both by our behavioral conformity to the law of God and by our internal motivation or desire to obey the law of God. I see people all around me who aren't believers, but who practice what John Calvin called civic virtue. That is, they do good things in society. They donate their money for good causes. They help the poor, and they themselves even sacrifice themselves for others. They do all kinds of wonderful things on the horizontal level toward people people toward God, but they do none of it because of their hearts, because their hearts have a pure and full love of God. There may be what Jonathan Edwards called an enlightened self-interest involved, but it is still self-interest. I once heard the story of a tragic fire, a building caught on fire, and there was, there was a rush to rescue the people who were inside of the inferno. The firefighters went in and brought out as many people as they could but it soon became too dangerous to go back into the building. Then they realized there was a child trapped in the building, and out of the crowd of bystanders, bystanders, one man, ignoring the danger, rushed into the building as everyone on the street cheered for him. A few minutes later, he came back out alive and safe with a bundle in his arms. The people continued to cheer, thinking that he had rescued the child, but then they realized that he had brought out his life savings and left the child to die. I do believe it's possible for an unbeliever to rush into a building to save a child, perhaps even at the cost of his life. That's civic virtue motivated by the natural concern that we have for one another. But such virtue isn't enough. When God looks at a human action, he asks, does this work proceed from a heart that loves me fully? 
Remember Jesus' commands. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all of your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Luke 10, 27. Therefore, if someone obeys the law outwardly, while his or her heart is not fully given to God, then that person's virtue has been tainted. That's why Augustine said, even our best virtues are but splendid vices. As long as we're in this body of flesh, sin will taint everything we do. That is what the rich young ruler did not understand. He thought he had achieved the standard. Paul warns in the New Testament that those who judge themselves by themselves are not wise. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. What's up, Scissor Tail? Welcome back. We can look at one another's performances and think that if we keep ourselves from adultery, murder, embezzlement, or some such egregious sin, then we're doing well. Since we always find, since we always can find people who are more sinful than we are, it would be easy to conclude that we're doing pretty well. Such was the mindset of the rich young ruler who came to Jesus. He thought Jesus was a good man, but Jesus stopped him in his tracks and reminded him of the law. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. That prompted the man to reveal his superficial understanding of the law. He said, all these things I have kept from my youth. Verse 21 in Luke. In other words, he was saying he had kept the Ten Commandments all of his life. Jesus could have said, well, I see you weren't at the Sermon on the Mount when I explained the deeper implications of these laws. You missed that lecture. Or he simply could have told the man, you haven't kept any of these commands since you got out of your bed this morning. Instead, he used a beautiful pedagogical method to teach this man his error. He said, one thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. At this point, Jesus was not teaching a new way of salvation. He was not saying that we can be saved by donating our goods to the poor. Neither was he implementing a universal mandate for people to divest themselves of all of their private property. He was dealing with this particular man, a rich man whose heart had been completely captured by his wealth. His money was his God, his idol. In essence, Jesus said to him, You say you have kept all the Ten Commandments. All right, let's check number one. You shall have no other gods before me. Exodus 23. Go, sell everything you have. After that, the man, who had been so enthusiastic only moments before, began to shake his head. He walked away sorrowful, because he had great possessions. Verse 23. That whole encounter was about goodness. Do we have enough goodness, enough righteousness to satisfy the, satisfy the demands of a holy God? Every page of the New Testament speaks to the truth that all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. Isaiah 64, 6. The person who is trusting in his righteousness to be saved has a false assurance. We cannot do enough to be saved. We are unprofitable servants. Sacerdotalism is the next one. The third common error that produces false assurance is sacerdotalism. This is the view that salvation is accomplished through the priesthood, through the sacraments, or through the church. People point to baptism, to the Lord's Supper, or to other rites and say, I have had these sacraments, which are a means of grace. I draw my assurance from having experienced the sacraments. There's a lot of Torah observance that also believe that. Hang on a second, I'm going to... Hey, Emrak, you're, you're full of hot air, bro. You can go. That is a ridiculous notion. What a dumb statement to make. You haven't even been here to listen to the rest of the lesson, and you're going to make a stupid statement like that? Can one of my mods mute him for a little bit? Put him in timeout? Please. On my profile, veteran 
Physical training. All right, brother. I hope you're feeling well. All right. Sacerdotalism. Saying, I've had these sacraments, which are a means of grace. I draw my assurance from having experienced the sacraments. Did you? No, you're still a moderator. Mm, yeah, you're a moderator, bro. It, according to according to what TikTok is showing me, anyway, um, you shouldn't have lost it. But anyway, I think he's I think he's being quiet now. This is the error that the Pharisees committed in the biblical days. They assumed that because they were circumcised, that therefore that they therefore were guaranteed a place in the kingdom of God. The sacraments are very important. They communicate the promises of God to us for our salvation. Plus, they are a means of grace that help us in our Christian lives. But the sacraments have never saved anyone. And anyone who puts his trust in sacraments has a false assurance of salvation because he is trusting in something that neither saves nor can save. Closely related to this idea, which is held by many people, that all a person must do to be saved is to join a church. They assume that since joining a church... Uh, includes them in the visible body of Christ, that they must be a part of the invisible church as well. So they put their confidence in their church membership. But membership in a church does not justify anyone. This is another illegitimate and false method of of assurance. Finally, in the so-called evangelical world, we have a few other sources of false assurance. Praying the sinner's prayer, raising one's hand at an evangelistic event, going forward during an altar call, or making a decision for Jesus. Those are all other false assurances. Those do not assure you, and those, those works themselves do not save you. These are all techniques or methods that are used to call people to repentance and faith. The danger is that people who say the prayer, raise a hand, walk the aisle, or make a decision, sometimes end up trusting in that particular act. Outward professions can be deceiving. One can go through the external motions of a profession of faith, but not truly be in possession of the inward reality of salvation. As you can see, there are many ways in which false assurance can come about. In the next chapter, we will discuss how these counterfeit forms of assurance can be avoided and overcome, and we will begin to explore legitimate methods of attaining assurance that is biblical and real. Well, I'm not going to leave you hanging at that, so we're going to keep going, guys. That's right, Scissor. Your decision for Jesus can be a result of your regeneration, absolutely. Proclaiming Christ's lordship, proclaiming him as king, is a symptom of the inner change. But proclaiming Jesus as king and making a decision at the altar is not what saves you. It doesn't change anything. And and typically, it can be used as an an emotionally manipulating tool that pastors and churches can use. I'm not saying that it's wrong. I'm not. I'm genuinely, I don't want, like... We're not all going to go grab pitchforks and run to the church and yell at the pastor and say that you're wrong for doing an altar call or having people raise their hands in church. That's not what I'm saying, and that's not what this book is saying either. Remember, we wrestle. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, guys. It's about principalities, all right? But we have to be honest when we have these conversations. Michelle 8135, I am reading Can I Be Sure I'm Saved by R.C. Sproul. It's a little tiny booklet. Uh, I picked up at a Ligonier conference uh, many years ago. Um, so, again, this goes back to, this is a chain, this is an inner working of the heart. This is a change of the heart. It is God changing the heart that draws us to repentance. And then God grants repentance to us. Ever heard of the Principality of Zion? I have not. I'm sorry, I have not. I'm going to go ahead and continue. I don't want to get too caught up in conversation until I finish reading this, okay? But I do appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thank you for the hammer, bro. Chapter 4, Gaining True Assurance.
When I was in seminary, one of my fellow students polled the students and the faculty members as to whether they were sure of their salvation. More than 90% of the respondents said that they were not sure. Moreover, they thought it would be arrogant for someone to claim to be sure of his salvation. They saw the idea of assurance not as a virtue, but as a vice. There was a negative connotation to the very pursuit of assurance of salvation, because it was assumed that it would lead to a state of arrogance. Of course, there's no worse arrogance than to have the assurance of something that we do not, in fact, that we do not in fact possess. To be certain of salvation when we are not in a state of salvation is arrogant. Likewise, we are arrogant if we say that assurance is not possible, because then we are slandering the truthfulness of God himself. If assurance is possible, we are arrogant if we do not seek it. I am a Jedi. I carry the purple uh, lightsaber. In considering the sources of false assurance, we saw that one of the most critical problems is an inaccurate understanding of the requirements of salvation. In other words, bad theology can produce false assurance. Therefore, as we begin to explore how we can gain a true and sound basis for our assurance of salvation, the first place we have to look is theology. And theology is the studying of God. One of the key scripts of scripture The key text of Scripture in regard to the pursuit of assurance is 2 Peter 1, 10 and 11, where we read, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm going to read that for you again. I want you to hear this as believers. If you trust in the Lord, I want you to hear the words of Scripture. 2 Peter 1, 10 through 11. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here, without ambiguity, the apostolic mandate is for us to inquire into the certainty of our election and not in a cavalier, casual way. Rather, we are to make our calling and our election sure through a diligent pursuit of, the apostle tells us this tells us this is very important and then goes on to give us practical reasons to be diligent in making our calling and election sure. Peter is very concerned about this concept of election. His first epistle is addressed to those who are elect exiles. 1 Peter 1.1 1, 1. He writes to the elect and teaches the elect what it means to be elect. Peter explains what election is supposed to look like in our spiritual journey. That's why in the second epistle, when he addresses the same people, he reminds them of how important it is to make their election sure. Peter's mention of election is very important, for it is here that we step through the doorway of theology. Many people do not believe in election, forgetting that it is a biblical concept. Others ask, how do you know whether you're elect or not? I tell people who are struggling with the concept of election that I cannot think of a more important question to get resolved in the Christian life than the question of whether we are numbered among the elect. If we have a sound understanding of election, and if we know that we are numbered among the elect, that knowledge provides unbelievable comfort to us as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Philippians 2.12 And as we encounter the various afflictions that are placed before us in our Christian lives. 2 Timothy 3.12 In 2 Timothy 1.12, Paul writes, I know whom I have believed, 
And I'm convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Paul is talking here about his confidence for his own future because of his knowledge of where he has put his faith. He says that he trusts not in his own power to persevere to the end of the race. Instead, his confidence is based on the one in whom he has believed. His confidence is in Jesus, knowing that that one is able to keep him. That is the kind of certainty of election that Peter is telling us to pursue with diligence. If we are called to make our election sure, then it follows that we are able to make our election sure. It is possible for us to know whether we are numbered among the elect. Therefore, we should not postpone seeking assurance till the end of our lives. We should seek it diligently now. We should get it settled that we are numbered among the elect and that we are in the kingdom of God that we have been adopted into the Father's house, and that we are truly in Christ, and He in us. But how do we do it? Gaining an accurate understanding of the doctrine of election is a crucial first step. As I noted earlier, many people today are hostile to the idea of divine election. And that hostility has led a number of views on what election involves. For example... Some people think that our salvation is the ground of our election. In this perspective, salvation, in a sense, precedes election. We call this the prescient or foreknowledge view of election. Those who hold this view on election believe that God elects to salvation those who will exercising who w- excuse me, let me start that over. Those who hold this view on election believe that God elects to salvation those who will exercise saving faith. By virtue of his foreknowledge, God looks down the corridor of time and sees who will respond positively to the offer of the gospel and who will not. On the basis of this prior knowledge of what people will do in response to the gospel message, he makes his decree of election. When he sees people exercising faith and entering into a state of salvation, he elects them on that basis. I do not believe this view of election is biblical or it explains election. I happen to also agree with R.C. In fact, I think it fundamentally denies the biblical teaching on election. I say this because the foreknowledge perspective on election makes the deciding factor in salvation in the final analysis something that we do rather than the grace grace and mercy of God. I think people who take this foreknowledge view of election invariably struggle with their with their assurance because their assurance is ultimately tied to their performance and to to make it even clearer to some people who may be struggling with the idea of election the reason that having the view that god looks down the corridor to see who responds to him would mean that god is learning something and if god is is learning something then god is not all knowing God is, cannot be sovereign if something can happen outside of his control. He is either in all control or does not have any control. And that's the, that is the current view that I hold when it comes to the sovereignty of God and the election of saints. God does not look down a corridor of time to see who will respond. Instead, God regenerates us at the point that he wills and desires and calls us to faith in Jesus Christ. The Father calls us out, draws us to Jesus. Jesus saves us by what he did on the cross, his his sacrifice, and the Holy Spirit seals that salvation and finalizes the process of salvation. And God can do as he pleases, Aunt Vicky. You are absolutely correct. God is in our God is in the heavens and he does what he wants. However, I will not say. And I don't think anyone should say that someone who has the other belief in election and salvation is not saved. I think that if you make that statement, that's an arrogant statement. It is not our calling. It is not our job as as created believing beings to call into question the salvation of those who proclaim Jesus. All right? It, it, is, a, it is merely a difference in understanding 
then I would say as I have come to, uh, as I continue in my studies and I continue in learning with the Lord, uh, I, I continue to learn concepts that I hadn't fully understood before. And now that I've wrestled with election, I've wrestled with predestination, I've come to a place of confidence in God, in God alone, not in my own works or anything that I've done. The Lord has brought me to a better understanding. That's it. And that's, I really, I truly believe, I truly believe that it's very arrogant to say someone is unsaved because they don't hold the same theological view as you. All right. All right. All right. Looks like my moderator's got something to do. It's unfortunate too, because I know some of you guys follow me for the news, but you're going to get blocked for a very long time because of your, your insanity. The people that are coming in here uh, blaspheming, uh, speaking evil, speaking out against God. If you liked me for the news, you're not going to get my news anymore because you, you don't even know how to control yourself online. All right. Well, Charles Oakley's got to go. Charles, you've had more than enough chances. He's gone. Um, no, I'm... Pena, I'm not, I'm not talking to you. I'm not talking to you. I don't even know what your question is. Again, I'm not answering questions until I get to the end of this. I just happen to see what you guys are talking about. All right. Uh, as I understand the scriptures, election is unto salvation. In this view, if you are elect, you will be saved. And if you are saved, that is the clearest sign that you are numbered among the elect. Let me say it another way. None who are saved are not elect. And none who are elect failed to be saved. Salvation flows out of election. So if we want to be sure of our salvation, we need to know whether we are numbered among the elect. In Peter's teaching, we see why it is important that we be diligent in making our calling and election sure. If we are sure that we are numbered among the elect, we can be certain with respect to our salvation. Not only for today, but for the future as well. This is true because election does not simply make salvation possible. It guarantees the salvation of the elect. In other words, the purpose of God in election is to save the elect. That purpose cannot and will not be frustrated. There is a scripture passage in which I take great comfort, even though it is not usually mentioned in this context. It is found in the Gospel of John in the middle of Jesus' high priestly prayer for his disciples and for those who would believe in him in future generations. In fact, this has been a passage of great encouragement for the church throughout the ages. All right, this is Jesus' words in the Gospel of John. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. This has got Jesus praying to the Father. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you, for I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me. This is Jesus. This is Jesus speaking. Uh, no, I think... Uh, Bible-believing servant's doing a good job for now. I think we'll be all right. He's, uh, he's, he's being wise in his, uh, in his moderation, unless it's not working for him. These are, listen, this is Jesus' words. Here, you know, I can always use I can always need more moderators, guys. Absolutely. There you go. Jesus is saying, as he's praying to the Father, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world. I do not pray for who? Jesus does not pray for the world, but he prays for who? Those the Father has given him. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those that you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine. And I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world. But these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those who you have given me, that they may be one as we are. 
While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, who is Judas, that the scripture might be fulfilled. In this prayer, Jesus says that the Father has given a certain group of people to him. These people are redeemed by the Son, because all whom the Father gives to the Son come to the Son, and are kept by him. When Jesus speaks of people who are given to him by the Father, he is referring to the elect. The elect whom the Amen, Aunt Vicky. The elect whom the Father gives to the Son are pre- preserved by the Son. That is the basis of our true assurance, not our own ability to persevere. We talk about the perseverance of the saints, and I believe that the saints do in fact persevere, but they persevere because they are preserved by God. So it's better to speak of the preservation of the saints than the perseverance of the saints. We hear that in Jesus' appeal to the Father to keep those that he is, that have been given to him. When we look further at the relationship between election and salvation, we need to be concerned with, the theolo- with what theologians call the Ordo Salutis, or the order of salvation. The Ordo Salutis has to do with the order in which various events occur that lead to our redemption, specifically the logical order rather than the temporal order. Here's what I mean by that distinction. We believe that we are justified by faith alone. But how long after we possess true saving faith are we justified? Is it five seconds, five minutes, five months, five years? No, we say that justification and faith are coter... Coterminous, I don't even know that word, with respect to time. The very moment we have true faith is the same instant that God receives us as justified people. Uh, sorry. But we still have, or, but we still say that faith comes before justification, even though they occur at the same time. Faith precedes justification logically. In other words, since our justification depends on and rests on faith, faith is the prerequisite, the necessary condition that has to be present for justification to take place. So, faith is logically necessary for justification. It precedes justification. Precedes. Not in time, but in term of logical necessity. So when we talk about the order of salvation, keep in mind that what we have in view are the distinctions with respect to prerequisites on the basis of logical necessity. In Romans 8, we have one of the most famous and beloved verses in all of the Old Test or all of the New Testament. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. I'm going to read that again, Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Notice that this promise that all things work together for good is for those who love God, those who are described as the ones who are called according to his purpose. That's a special kind of calling. The Bible speaks about the call of the gospel that goes out to everyone, that we we call the outward call, or what we call the outward call, or the external call. Not everyone who hears this call is saved. We also speak of the inward call, the call of the person in the spirit, in the heart, which is at work, which is a work of God and the Holy Spirit, and and which call is effectual. In this call, the Holy Spirit opens the heart of believers, working within to bring about the purpose of God. It is this call Paul has in view of Romans 8.28. All of the elect receive this inward call, as someone as uh, as becomes very clear in the following verses, Romans 8.29. Let's look at the first half of verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, to be conformed to the image of his Son. Paul is talking here about the purposes of God with no respect to salvation, and he begins by mentioning God's foreknowledge. 
He tells us that those whom God foreknew, he predestined. It was, uh, it was that those God foreknew would be conformed to the image of God. In verse 30, we encounter what we call the golden chain. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This is an abbreviated version of the order of salvation. There are other aspects to salvation besides those mentioned here. Romans 8.30 hits the highlights as it were. For instance, sanctification is not in this list. Rather, this list includes, going back to verse 29, first, foreknowledge, second, predestination, third, calling, fourth, justification, and fifth, glorification. It is very important for our understanding of assurance to grasp what is going on in this order of salvation. As I noticed, Paul is referring to a logical order. Hey, go ahead and mute sourdough, Dougie. Here, I'll do it. He's he's obviously uh, he's obviously just trolling. Uh, you got five minutes, buddy. Let's all uh, let's all just be civil in here, okay? Let, let's not be let's not be distracted. Um, it's I don't think it's oh, well, peppermint folly. You're gonna get some of that Christian love too, but I'm not muting you this time. I'm banning you. How about that? You can Christian love that. Uh, I got two moderators now, brother. I appreciate it though. Thank you. Uh, I, I can't make too many because it, it won't let me make too many. Christian, love this block. <laughs> All right. I hope it heaps hot coals on their head and I hope they repent. It is very important for our understanding of assurance to grasp what is going on in this order of salvation. As I noted, Paul is referring to a logical order and it starts with foreknowledge. The prescient view of election that I mentioned earlier is popular because people come to this text and say, aha, the first step is foreknowledge. That means election or predestination is based on something that God knows about his people in advance. Well, it is because God chose them. (laughs) But the text does not say that. In fact, as Paul elaborates on this in Romans 9, he precludes that possibility. According to the Reformed understanding of election, the people who are elect according to God's decrees are not nameless ciphers. For God to elect someone, he must have some idea of whom he is electing. So foreknowledge must precede predestination, because God is predestining specific individuals whom he loves and chooses. The next logical event is predestination. Paul tells us that those whom God foreknew, he also predestined. It is unstated but clearly understood here that all who are in the category of the foreknown are predestined. Yes, many are many are called, but few are chosen. That's right. The gospel calling goes out to all of the world. Everybody in the world hears the gospel call. Everyone in the world will have an opportunity, well, not may, will have an opportunity, but if you look at today's world, the gospel is out there. People have a chance to hear it. Many are called, but few are chosen. Because there's a lot of people on earth, and not all of them are called to God. Not all of them are chosen by God. Uh, Of course, God's foreknowledge in general includes all people, not just the elect, because God knows all people. So God foreknows all people, all right? But Paul is speaking here about God's foreknowledge of his elect. How do we know that? Because Paul declares that all whom God foreknows, in the sense that he foreknows them here, are predestined. And all who are predestined are called. And all who are called are justified. That is the crucial point. If all who are called are justified, Paul cannot possibly be referring to the external call. He must be speaking of the internal call. Because all who receive this particular call receive justification, just as all who are justified are glorified. So, if I want to know whether I'm going to be glorified, that is, whether I'm going to be saved in the final analysis, I need to determine whether I'm justified. If I'm justified, I know that I'm going to be glorified. 
In other words, if I'm justified now, I have nothing to worry about. He who has begun a good work in me is going to finish it to the end. That is Philippians 1.6. Some are called denying the calling. Nobody denies their calling. You are referring to people, you're not referring to the call, you can't deny the calling of God. If God calls you, you are called forever. You you cannot reject, you can't reject a, an, an omnipotent God who sets, who sets the course his entire will from the beginning to end. No, he didn't. He did in in a temporal sense. He did, but he didn't. That's a ridiculous. That's that's ridiculous, truther. He didn't reject it because what ended up happening? He went into the belly of the whale for three days and was spit up on the shore and did exactly what God called him to do. In the temporal moment, as we read, it seems like he's rejecting the call, but he doesn't. Because God's will will always be done, even if that means that God sends a whale to consume you for three days in his belly. God's will will always be done. It's silly. Don't don't do that. Don't do that. Don't be silly. All right. Where does calling where does calling fit into our assurance? I'll say more about this in the next chapter, but for now let me say that if the calling Paul mentions in Romans 8:23 and through 30 has reference to the operation of the Holy Ghost on the soul that prepares us for faith and justification. And if we know that we have received this call, we know we are elect. How do we know whether we are called? Paul provides the answer in Ephesians 2. So how do you know if you're called? Ephesians 2, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. And you... He made alive. Who made alive? God. Who did he make alive? You. What were you before you were alive? Dead in your trespasses and sins. How did you make yourself alive, dead man? You didn't. Because God makes you alive. Ephesians 2. And you, who he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of flesh, of our flesh. Amen. Jesus is king. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature children of wrath just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. By what? Grace. By grace, you have been saved. By what? Grace. By grace, you have been saved. Hang on a second. I'm I'm logging into my thermostat so I can... Change. It's getting warm in my house. And I'm wearing a sweatshirt. Don't judge me. It was cooler earlier. By grace, we have been saved. And the rest of this passage is fantastic. It's going to very clearly lay out a further proof. By grace, you have been saved and raised up together and made to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Being saved is what? The gift of God. Sorry, I was making sure my kid wasn't burning the house down. It is by grace you have been saved. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Wait a minute. Who prepared these works for us? God. When did God prepare these works for us? Beforehand. When? Before the foundations of earth. Before we were born, 
before our time on earth, God prepared these works for us to walk in and that we should walk in them. We are his workmanship. Lest anyone should boast. Do you know when you get to boast? You get to boast if you say, yeah, you know, I chose Jesus. That's boasting. You know, it's also, it's boasting when you said, yeah, you know, I, I made the decision to follow Jesus. That's boasting. That's arrogance. That's arrogance. You didn't save yourself, oh man. Who are you? You're telling me that you were dead in sin and somehow just decided one day to bring yourself to life? Wow, you must be pretty special. You must be pretty special that God can't control your decisions. Just just, res- just simmer on that for a second. In this brief summary, Paul is focusing on the works of the Holy Spirit by which we are made alive, a work we understand theologically as our rebirth or regeneration. Jesus told Nicodemus that rebirth must occur before anyone can see the kingdom, let alone enter it, John 3, 3 and 5. And rebirth is tied to this internal calling. So as we seek assurance, we can, we can know we're numbered among the elect. Because without election, this work of the Holy Ghost could never take place in our souls. I thought we muted him. Are you going to behave yourself, Doug? Because I'll just block you. I'm not answering questions right now. I'll answer questions after. So all who are elect will become at some point in this life regenerate by the Holy Spirit. Likewise, all who are regenerate are numbered among the elect. So if you can be sure of your regeneration, you can be sure of your election. And if you're sure of your election, then you can be sure of your salvation. All right, Randy, we'll see you. Therefore, it is critical that we understand what regeneration is. There is massive confusion in the Christian world about the nature of this act of the Spirit. People who call themselves evangelicals in America believe very different things about what happens to a person when the Holy Spirit regenerates him from spiritual death to spiritual life. That's why having a sound doctrine of regeneration is critical to having full assurance of our state of grace and our relationship to God. So in the last chapter, I want to look at the work of the of God, the Holy Spirit in our lives as the most important foundation for genuine assurance of salvation. Final chapter, guys, you've made it. We're almost there. Let's do it. We won't have to do a part three. I appreciate you guys sticking around with me. Let's keep going. The source of full assurance. Polls conducted by organizations such as Gallup and the Barna Group routinely find that tens of millions of Americans claim to be born-again Christians. Unfortunately, many of these people have a woeful understanding of what it means to be born again. If asked, they will say, well, a born-again Christian is someone who made a decision of an evangelistic sort, or a born-again person is someone who has said the sinner's prayer. Yet these actions are not true indications that a person has been born again. As we have seen, it is possible to make a profession of faith without being regenerated. To be born again means to be changed by the supernatural operation of God, the Holy Spirit. Understanding this is critical for our assurance of salvation. In the previous chapter, we looked at Ephesians 2, where we saw a strong contrast between our experience before and after regeneration of the Holy Spirit. Prior to regeneration, we follow the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. That describes the life of the fallen person who is not reborn. But after the new birth, we are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. What takes place in regeneration? What is the change that is affected by the operation of the Holy Spirit in our souls? Part of the dispute about regeneration focuses on differences in our understanding of original sin. All professing Christians believe that mankind experienced some kind of a fall and that there's something wrong with our uh, constituent nature. 
We all believe that we are corrupt creatures, but there are massive differences with respect to the degree, wow, voice crack, degree of that fall. In other words, with respect to the degree of moral corruption that arose as a result of the fall. There are Christians who believe that, yes, man is fallen, but there remains in the soul, as corrupt as the soul may be, what I call a small island of righteousness that is unaffected by the fall. From this island of righteousness, a person still has the power to cooperate with God's offer of grace before he or she is regenerated. However, I cannot find this idea anywhere in Scripture. When we read Scripture's teachings on our natural state, we see such descriptions as bondage to corruption, Romans 8.21, dead in transgressions and sins, Ephesians 2.1, and children of wrath, Ephesians 2.3. Historically, the church has understood these statements to mean that the unregenerate person has a moral bent, a bias against God. By nature, the scriptures tell us that we are at enmity with God, and the word enmity is a description of a hostile attitude. Before we are generated, regenerated, we are disinclined towards the things of God. We have no genuine affection for Christ, and there is no love for God in our hearts. How, then, can we know that we are regenerate? At a practical level, people who are struggling with their assurance of salvation often approach me and ask, how can I know that I'm saved? In response, I ask them three questions. First, I ask, do you love Jesus perfectly? Every person to whom I have asked that question has respondedly has responded candidly saying, no, I don't. That's why they are not sure of the state of their souls. They know that their deficiencies in their affections for Christ. Because they know that if they loved Christ perfectly, they would obey him perfectly. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So as soon as we disobey one of his commandments, that's a signal to us that we do not love him perfectly. Second, when a person acknowledges that he doesn't love Jesus perfectly, I ask, do you love him as much as you ought to? The person usually gives me a strange look and says, well, no, of course I don't. That's right. If the answer to the first question is no, the, second, the answer to the second question has to be no, because we are supposed to love him perfectly, but we don't. Therein lies the tension that we experience about our salvation. Third, I ask, well, do you love Jesus at all? Before the person answers, I usually add that I'm asking about his love for the biblical Christ, the Christ whom we encounter in the pages of the Holy Scripture. Why do I say that? Many years ago, I taught at the Young Life Institute in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and I did a lot of work in those days with and for Young Life. When I was training staff in Colorado, I said, let me warn you about one grave danger of this ministry. I don't know personally of any ministry to young people in this world that's get that's more effective than Young Life at getting next to kids, getting involved in their issues, and getting involved in their problems. Ministering to kids where they are and knowing how to get them to respond. That's the greatest strength of this organization, and it's also your greatest weakness. Because Young Life, as a ministry, makes Christianity so attractive to kids, it would be easy for kids to be converted to Young Life without being converted to Christ. In just the same way, it's possible to love a caricature of Jesus rather than Jesus himself. So when I ask people, do you love Jesus at all? I'm not asking whether they love a Christ who is a hero for kids or a Christ who is a good moral teacher. I'm asking whether they love the Christ who appears in scripture. Now, if someone can say yes to that third question, that's where theology comes in. Consider this question, is it possible for an unregenerate person to have any true affection for Christ? My answer is no. Affection for Christ is a result of the Spirit's work. That is what regeneration is all about. That is what the Spirit does in quickening. God, the Holy Spirit, changes the disposition of our souls and the inclination of our hearts. Before regeneration, we are cold, hostile, or indifferent which is the worst kind of hostility, to the things of God, having no honest affection for him because we are in the flesh, and the flesh does not love the things of God. For uh, love for God is kindled by the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit, who pours the love of God into our hearts, Romans 5.5. 5. 
So if a person can answer yes when I ask whether he has an affection for Christ, even though he may not love Jesus as much as he ought, which is perfectly, that assures me that the Spirit has done this transforming work in his soul. This is so because we do not have the power in our flesh to conjure up any true affection for Jesus Christ. Now, I want to add a personal testimony to this. When my when my son, my oldest son, had turned 18 years old, we were having a conversation in the kitchen, and we were talking about Jesus, and he was having conversations with his friends, and so he was feeling a little down and feeling a little kind of like frustrated <laughs> because he doesn't have any memory of a conversion experience. My son was saved at a young age. All of my kids have been saved at young ages. So he doesn't have a life in which he lived where sin ruled his life. He has only known Jesus. So in in tears, my 18-year-old son came to me and said, Dad, how can I know that I'm saved? What if I'm not? What if I'm not saved? And I looked at him and I said, and this this is a true story. I looked at him and I said, son, no one that isn't saved cares about making sure they're saved. And that to me is the truth. And I will, and that is something that I will tell people anytime that they ask me, how can I be sure that I'm saved? How can I make sure that I am the elect? No one who isn't saved cares about being saved. They don't care. Their affections are not towards the Lord. And in order for their affections to be towards the Lord, they have to be regenerated by the Holy Spirit. There you go. I just wanted to share that with you. All right. It To me, I love it, man. I love when God gives me those little things that I can experience. And I love that I can pour that into my kids, too. Sister, faithful and fun, listen to me, sister. No one no one who wants to love Jesus will be denied the ability to love Christ. No one who loves who desires to love Jesus to spend an eternity in him worshiping, honoring and glorifying him, no one will be denied that. That is a work that God has done in you. He's done that in you. He's already changed your heart. Have assurance, sister and brothers in here. Have assurance that to know Jesus is a work of God. That's a work of the Holy Spirit. That means you're one of the elect. You've been called out. You've been. So now what do you do with that information? Turn and serve him with your whole life. Glorify him, know him, read the Bible, get involved in a church, get involved in a local ministry, a women's or a men's ministry, and get to know your Lord. (laughs) Isn't that a blessing? You are not meant to live in fear that you may be unsaved or God may reject you. You were born being rejected. God took you out of that rejection and put you in a place of adoption of his son. We share, we are joint heirs with Christ, guys. Our first brother, Jesus, died for us that we can share in the same salvation. It is a beautiful, glorious thing, and may God get all of the glory and honor and praise. We have to walk in a boldness that we have been brought out of sin into life. We can know, and now that you have that knowledge, you have to do something about it. Yeah, man, I am crying. I am absolutely, the the Lord stirs up emotions in me all of the time, and I am so grateful that I can know my God and that he he can impress upon me his goodness and his grace to the point that it brings me to tears. I don't cry over a lot of things, but when I hear the things of the Lord, it wells up in me a fountain that I cannot hold in. And I, I am glorified that you don't like that. I am, I am honored that you hate that. I am honored that you are frustrated that I cry tears towards my God. I am honored by that, by your rejection, by the rejection of the world. I am honored to know that I serve a master far greater than your judgment. 
I serve a master far greater than your prejudice towards me, than your evil and your hatefulness towards me. I serve a God that values me for who I am, not what I look like, not what I do, but for the mission and the purpose that he has given me. That is the God that I serve and that you reject. And don't worry, you will be judged by that very same God. Your knee will bow. Your tongue will confess. Let's finish this together, shall we? Hello from Malaysia. How are you? He needs to be he needs to be gone now. Let's block him. You love death. You will get your exact reward. You will spend your eternity in hell away from God because that's what you want. And God will honor that. He's not going to force you to be in heaven with him, brother. I tell you, you better repent and get to know who God is. It's very unfortunate. These people don't realize that they prove God with their hate. They app, they, well, he needs to go to see you later, buddy. Have a nice day. Thanks you for coming in. Thanks for boosting the algorithm. These guys prove the existence of scripture. They prove the validity of scripture by their very words, their hatred towards God. These people are assured. (laughs) They are assured of their non-salvation. There are views of regeneration out there that won't give you that kind of assurance. One of the most popular views of regeneration in the evangelical world today holds that regeneration Uh, That at regeneration, the Holy Spirit simply comes into your life and indwells you. But even after regeneration, according to this view, you have to respond to the Spirit to cooperate with Him and to put Him in charge of your life because it's possible for you to be regenerate and dwell by the Holy Spirit and yet never bring forth any fruits of obedience. You can become, as what what some people call, a carnal Christian Oh, you do hate God, sourdough, and you're and you're gone now. You had you've had your chance. You're just espousing evil in this, and I'm not going to allow you to glorify your idols. I'm sorry. Oh no, G hippie, I don't mute when you have questions. I mute when you're a, a dangerous person that blasphemes God. And you're blocked now, so you won't even be muted anymore. You're blocked for good. He was in here yesterday. <clears throat> when the New Testament uses the word carnal, it means that we start out being purely carnal. When we are in the flesh, the Holy Spirit changes the disposition of our hearts. He doesn't immediately annihilate the flesh. The carnal dimension still wages war with us. The flesh battles with the spirit throughout the entire Christian life. And there are times when we are more or less carnal, Galatians 5.17. There is no dispute about that. However, some use the term carnal Christian to describe a person who remains unchanged by the presence of the Holy Ghost. When the term is used this way, it does not describe a Christian, but an unregenerate person. So I reject this view of regeneration out of hand as involving no regeneration at all. Because although the Spirit supposedly enters into the person's life, it does not produce a supernatural work. Of grace that changes the inclination and disposition of the soul. The person remains the same in his soul as he was before the Spirit came. It is critical to understand that regeneration is something that the Holy Spirit does that really and truly changes a person. It changes the very disposition of his soul. If a person is truly regenerate and manifests faith, it is possible for that person to not bring forth some measure of obedience. Boy, just the trolls are just, they're, they're, they're good today, huh? We've got some, we've got some interesting characters in the chat. I'm almost done, guys. We have seen that regeneration is the work of the Holy Spirit by which the inclination of the soul is changed, but does not only but not only does the Holy Spirit change us via regeneration, he does other things that are important 
to our assurance of salvation. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5 reads, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For this in this tent we groan, longing to be put into our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that would we that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Other translations, yeah, you can Thanos anybody you want, Riss. I got a lot of moderators in here now. Um other translations of the Bible render the word guarantee as earnest. The language here comes from the commercial world of the ancient Greeks. Today, about the only time we hear the word earnest used as a noun is in the arena of real estate. If you are interested in buying a home and you want to sign the initial contract for the sellers to take the home off the market, they will ask that you give uh, what some people call earnest money. They don't want to deal with people who are just playing around with the idea of buying a house. They want people who are earnest about it. In other words, people who are serious about it. The idea in 2 Corinthians 5.5 5 is that the Spirit, when He regenerates us, not only changes the disposition of our hearts and the inclination of our souls, He becomes for us the earnest or the guarantee of full and final payment. When I buy something over a period of time, I have to make a down payment. Now, we know that there are many people who enter into contracts, make a few payments, then renege. Sometimes a person's house is foreclosed on or his car is repossessed because he fails to keep the contracts of the terms of a contract. With the down payment, he promises to pay the whole amount, but people, but people don't always come through. However, when God makes a down payment on something, that down payment is his word. It is his promise that he will, in fact, pay the whole amount. This is the language that Paul is using when he says that we are born of the Spirit. Not only does the Spirit change our hearts, our souls, and our wills, but he gives to us the pledge, the guarantee that the fullness of salvation will be realized. People overlook this fact when they say, well, I may be saved today, but tomorrow I could lose it. This ignores the biblical truth that God finishes what he starts. God finishes what he starts. When he makes a down payment, the rest will be paid, guaranteed. This is a firm basis for our assurance. Let's take one more example from 2 Corinthians 1. Because I want, uh, because I was sure of this, I wanted to come to you first so that you might have a second experience of grace. I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and to come back to you from Macedonia and have you send me on my way to Judea. Was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? Do I make my plans according to the flesh, ready to say yes, yes, and no, no at the same time? As surely as God is faithful, our word to you has not been yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. Who? God himself. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. What is Paul saying here? Simply that God does not vacillate on his promises. He does not say yes and no. All of his promises, the apostle tells us, are fully and firmly established by the divine character, which is marked by faithfulness. Then Paul goes on to say, And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us, and who has also put his seal on us, and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. God puts his seal on our hearts as a guarantee. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22. There it is again, the guarantee of the spirit. But not only do we have the guarantee or the earnest of the Spirit, we also, Paul tells us, 
that he repeats this idea later in Ephesians. We are sealed by the Holy Ghost. The Greek word for seal is sphragis. Perhaps you've seen movies of the Middle Ages that show the various customs of monarchs. When a king sent out to de- a decree to be posted in the villages, a wax seal was affixed to the proclamation. That seal was the sign of the king, which was based on his signet ring. Etched inside of his signet ring was a certain shape or form that contained the sign of his signature. So if a document, a proclamation, or an edict contained the seal in wax from the king's signet ring, that was irrefutable testimony of its authenticity. Paul tells us here in 2 Corinthians that the king of the universe places his indelible mark on the soul of every one of his people. He not only gives us an ironclad guarantee, he seals us for the day of redemption. Finally, in Romans 8, we read these encouraging words. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption to whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. You can say 2 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians. It doesn't matter. It's the same book. Don't, don't make foolish arguments over semantics. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. As we study our lives and hearts, the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22 through 24, and the measure of, our ch- of change in our lives, we must be honest in our evaluation of what's going on inside of us and through us. But in the final analysis, the bedrock of our assurance of salvation comes from the internal testimony of the Holy Spirit. For he bears witness to our spirit inside of us that we are the children of God. How do we know that this testimony to our spirits is from the Holy Spirit and not from an evil spirit? How does the Holy Spirit confirm in our hearts that we are children of God? The Spirit bears witness to our spirits through the Word. The farther we get away from the Word, the less assurance we will experience in this life. Listen, brothers and sisters. The farther we get away from the Word, the less assurance we will experience in this life. Go ahead and Thanos, thank you. The more we are in the Word of God, the more the Spirit who inspired the Word and who illumines us Uh, illumines it for us, will use the word to confirm in our souls that we are truly his and that we are indeed among the children of God. In other words, if you have been reading the Bible and you continually learn and get better revelation, you continually learn and gain confidence in faith, if you are continually in your word and you are and it is being illuminated, it is being brought drawn out to you that is sufficient for each of your experiences, that can be your assurance that the Holy Spirit has sealed in you to salvation. Now guys, I would love I I really I desperately want to hear what you guys think of this teaching on assurance of salvation. I really want to hear in the comments if you if you liked it, if you didn't like it, if it if you learned something new. While you guys begin doing that, I'm going to go back and and read uh, the comments. I have to go to the bathroom, so I'm going to be right back. Give me like three minutes. Don't leave. Don't go anywhere. Moderators, do your thing. Let them know that I'm I'm gone. I'm going to mute my mic so you don't hear me peeing.
All right, guys. Let me uh, let's catch up on comments here. Um, Precept ministers helps me to learn the inductive, learn to inductively study. Amen. Um, most modern games have auto save enabled, and they auto back up to the cloud. <laughs> Least of these. Hey, what's up, brother? Yeah, I'm not leaving, bro. I'm not leaving. Um, we all witness to the death and resurrection. I got you, bro. Um, I just heard tail end of the reading, but I liked it. All right, Scarlet the Red. Well, it, these will be uploaded to YouTube. Um, if you go to our YouTube channel, I have a podcast called The Doctrines of Rad, uh, and we have a YouTube channel called The Doctrines of Rad. Um, and if you go to the playlist Drew's Videos, all of my Bible readings, all of my live Q and A's, everything that I do on TikTok Live gets posted there. Uh, so we've read through John, we've read through Ephesians, we've just had a Q and A session. Uh, so it all gets posted there, and you are absolutely welcome to go watch those anytime. Um, if you missed the majority of this, we were talking about can I be sure that I'm saved, which is an R.C. Sproul uh, book, a little pamphlet, uh, and that's what we were talking about. Uh, Scissor Tail says, I just found out, found this live this week. Thank you, Scissor Tail. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm here to answer your questions, 48 hours. Let's go. I need to look up to see if Ligonier still does conferences. They do. They do. Now, RC is passed on, but there are several fellows within the Ligonier ministry that are, that are carrying on his legacy. Um, I went to a conference in 20, maybe 16, I think maybe 2017. It was uh, held in Washington state. Drew shut up in the last four minutes of my life this morning. Oh, thanks, man. You guys are too kind. I'm not, I'm not an important person, guys. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not special. I'm not different. I'm, I'm literally, I'm literally just a guy on TikTok. There is nothing, there is nothing about me here. I'm going to take my glass off because of the reflection. There is nothing about me that is that makes me unique that stands out i am i am a vessel for god and he will use me as he sees fit and that's the only thing that i just want to impress upon people is look i mean i just want you to love jesus the way that i do i think i think like i'm not perfect in loving jesus but i i do know him and because i know him with confidence knowing him i want you also to know him i was uh, depressed for last week i read god's word and depression went away yeah ab- absolutely and sometimes it won't, and that's okay too. But you have to dig in, and you have to dig your feet in. Sometimes you have to clothe yourself in in ash and sackcloth, and and pray and fast, and and really get through some stuff, you know. Uh, but getting into the Word is is absolutely essential for all ailments, um, specifically ailments of the mind and of the heart. You know, depression, anxiety, all of those things. Uh, I deal with depression and anxiety. I I totally get it. I've been right there with you, and uh, it's very hard. But the Word of God is the only thing that brings us through. Stand and speak. Amazing how we believe a loving God would make it so difficult for us to discern through Revelation. Um, a loving God makes it very. He makes it very easy for those He calls to serve Him in His purpose. It is very easy. It's it's very simple. <laughs> There's there are challenges in the battle of the flesh, for sure, uh, but a loving God loves those that He loves, and uh, those that He calls and predestines. Biden has COVID. That can't be true. He just said that if you get vaccinated, you'll never get COVID. He can't have COVID. Yes, Scarlet the Red, uh, the Doctrines of Rad, R-A-D. Yep, that's correct. We also have a TikTok too where I uh, uh, I upload like different clips and stuff from the show. Drew, are you a Calvinist? I am. I am a Calvinist. I was not always one. I, uh, I, I, when I got saved, I was in a, a Assemblies of God, very charismatic church. Um, very full of the spirit, but very light on doctrine and theology. Uh, and over the years I became a Calvinist because I wrestled uh, a lot with the idea of salvation. Uh, I wrestled with, um, the election and predestination. It was very, uh, I wrestled with it for about two years, um, because 
the words are in the Bible, the concepts are in the Bible, and I needed to know why and what they meant. And a lot of people had a lot of different answers. And it wasn't until I met um, another Calvinist that uh, I was able to get those answers through scripture, not just through his words. Is it true that we should keep politics out of the church? Um, I think you should keep politics out of church service. But I think as a body of believers, it's important for us to be, you know, we look in America, we've been born in America. We've been born in a democratic republic. We get to vote. All right. That's how the law and the systems work here in the country in which we've been born. All right. And we Christians do have a the idea of Christian civics and a Christian civic duty is very real. I mean, we're called to go. A true religion, as James says, is taking care of the widows and the orphans. Like our, it's our civic duty to go to people that are less fortunate, to to be a voice for the voiceless, to uh, to give to people that don't have what we have. That's our civic duty as Christians, and a lot of that is in politics. Now, what you need to be wary of, or at least my suggestion is, be very careful of idolatry within politics. Be very careful with the thought that this politician is going to save me from my situation. Be very careful that this president is going to fix things. Okay, God fixes things. And if something is happening that we think is broken, God is allowing it to happen. So it needs to start here for us. And a lot of the times when this changes and when we are sanctified and, and God is showing us, you know, what's wrong with us and where we fall short, a lot of the times we don't have we don't have a lot of time and opportunity to focus on what the politicians are saying. Like, regardless of what Joe Biden or Donald Trump says, I have to serve Jesus. Jesus is my king. So it doesn't matter who's in the White House. You know, so don't get caught up in the in the idolatry of it. That to me is the most dangerous part of politics is the idolatry that a, a man or woman or person in office will save you. That is not how it works and that's not what the Bible teaches. But the Bible is very clear that God sets up governments. God sets up organizations and we are to give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Uh, you are God's instrument. Thank you guys. I thought you were a monk at first. I'll, I'll take it. I'll t- <laughs> I will take it. Anamare Patre de Spiritu Sante. No, I'm not. I'm just a cool looking guy with a hoodie in the summer. A hoodie in the summer. <laughs> Wear a hoodie in the summer. Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> I can't unsee Monk Drew. Well, I suppose the next time I play D&D with my son, I will have to be a monk class. And now that I'm a Christian, I obviously have to always be chaotic. Good. This is the will of God for you, your sanctification. Amen. Emmy says, or MZs, how would you answer why God allows suffering to children? Um, I would counter that with uh, why, why does God save any? The world, the world is suffering. You know, we're, God allows Oh, hang on a second. I'm getting a text from my father-in-law. Okay. I will answer that later. Um, before Christ, we are in a fallen nature. And our fallen nature leads us to do anything that our pride, our ego, or whatever would want to do. And that leads to suffering whether it's a child or a wife or a victim or whatever that leads to suffering. Sin is prevalent. Sin is missing the mark. We've all fallen short because of what happened with Adam, because of Adam's disobedience, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, that, that evil is real. And, and how much more do we need to cling to the one who is good in the midst of those evil things that happen in this life? Um, God allows suffering for his own glory. There's no, there's no easier way to say that. There's no, I mean, look at Job. Job had every excuse in the world to blame God for all of the, all of the suffering he was going through. And the end, the conversation that Job had with God was a one-way conversation of God saying, 
Where were you when I did this? Where were you when I created this? Where were you when I did this? Where were you? God does not rely on the thoughts and feelings of man to determine what best glorifies him. Now, it can grieve us, and I do believe that sin should grieve us, and I think that that sin grieves God. But ultimately, God's glory is that much more known, even in pain and suffering. Pain is not always a problem. It's inconvenient and uncomfortable, but pain often brings us to a better, uh, more righteous and even holier understanding of who God is. I may start addressing him as Monsignor. The beauty to God's word is uh, we, we can, small or great. Uh, Biden never said that. Is that more truth? Biden did say that, actually. I can, that's cool, stand and speak. Hey, give me one second. Uh, let me see. You know what? I'm not going to do it. I'm not even going to entertain foolishness. Biden did say that. You can look it up on YouTube. You can go find out when the vaccines first came out how Biden was saying that if you get the vaccine, you won't get COVID. It's, you, don't, you don't need me to explain that to you. You just don't be lazy. Just go to YouTube. Just go look it up for yourself. That's it. Hypercharismania is what kept me from a conference. Uh, yeah, hypercharismania is fun. Uh, why has America been at war with the rest of the world for 250 years? Um, Smudgy, the world has been at war. America has not been at war with the rest of the world. That's not even an accurate, that's not even accurate in comparison. That That's, that's a very U.S. centric view. The world has been at war forever. <laughs> the world has constantly been at war. My entire Navy career was during the Afghanistan war. 20 years during we have the world has been at war war will rage on because of you know why because arrogance and pride of man because everybody thinks that they need to tell everybody else how to do and how to live and none of them care about the sanctity of life all right let me uh praying for your soul is not mock mockery it is the height of love I vote for the person whose policies line up most with scripture. And that's fine. And if you want to vote, you vote. I'm not voting anymore. Hi, Ellie Tulip. Thank you, sister. Appreciate that. And that's my personal conviction. I'm not going to vote. Now, the Lord may change my mind and show me later down the road, but uh, I'm, I'm done. I'm done with politics. Give me Jesus and Jesus alone. Whoever is in office, I'm going to serve Jesus. And I'm not telling anybody to take the same view as me. You, you are you are your own person. You vote based on your convictions or don't vote at all. Uh, but I, I I laugh at the notion that it that I must vote. That's a very American thing to say. I don't have to if I don't want to. And and I right now I don't want to. Uh, brother, you'd be losing that hoodie in Texas. It's hot here in Missouri. I'm just cold in my room. I have a vent right above my head, so I'm get kind of chilly. Uh, there's a bigger house to worry about than the White House. That's right, sister. Hey, Hebrit, Hilbrit, Hip, Hebrit, he hybrid, hybrid. Um, I feel like all those bad things are not God doing it. I think He knows about it. But if God does everything, man, like we have to get away from this notion that God does not allow for the destruction of people. We God very clearly with Job. Satan went to to God to say, this guy only serves you because you've blessed him. God had to give Satan permission to mess with Job or else Job wouldn't have do it, wouldn't, uh, or else Satan couldn't have done it. God gave Satan permission to take things away and even affect Job's health. God was absolutely ever present in all of that. So we, it's a very, it's a very postmodern idea that God doesn't uh, approve of or allow for the type of evil that takes place. That's a very silly notion. That's It's just not true. God, God has written from beginning to end. He is the alpha and the omega. He has set all things in order and he is creating order out of chaos. And what better way does God be glorified is when he takes chaos and he brings about order. Uh, if you do want to learn more about evil and the problem of evil, though, I have a great recommendation for a book. This is by 
Pastor Scott Christensen. It's called What About Evil? A Defense of God's Sovereign Glory. Uh, I had him on a podcast many years ago um, and interviewed him about this book. He also wrote a book called What About Free Will? It's really good. So I have to recommend that. Uh, am I still frozen? I might be on your end. Oh, you have to vote, brother. <laughs> I can't imagine living my life with all of its ups and downs without the Spirit of God in me. Yeah, amen. Uh, will I vote locally? Um, maybe. Maybe. I, I'd much rather be involved in my community in a way where I'm serving others. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I just The Lord hasn't really given me a lot of good answers for that. Put it up again so I can take a pic. Okay, hang on. Ugh, you can't just write it down, Joe. What about evil? A sovereign defense of God's sovereign, or a defense of God's sovereign glory. Ugh. All right, let me keep going here on the comments. Uh, I just feel more like God uses it to get non-believers to change. God uses God uses destruction and tragedy all the time to draw people to Him. In fact, I think that most most cases of people being saved, they're usually at their lowest point in life, and God allows them that because it de it debases us, it removes all of the idols. Everything has failed us. The world has failed us. Our family has failed us. Our government has failed us. Whatever it is, it's failed us. And that draws us to the Lord. But what else is there? If all of these, these superficial things in front of me have failed us, there's nowhere else to go. Oh, you're working out. Okay. All right, bro. I got you. Bro. <laughs> Uh, Many Faces of Evil by Feinberg. I haven't read that one yet. I haven't heard that one. That's what I was trying to say. Sorry. So, no, you're fine, 48 Hour. You're, you're not. Don't apologize. There's nothing to apologize for. We're here talking about Jesus. Logan. What up, Logan? What are you doing? Are you working? Who's? I'm not really taking guest requests right now. I'm I, I appreciate you asking, but uh, I uh, I don't typically do Q and A. I'll do Q and A's later. I just won't. I just I'm not doing it now. Um, like when I bring guests in, you're on, you're at a roofing conference. Lame. I don't want to upset people. I look at things differently than most. Well, you won't upset me unless you start blaspheming God. Then I'm just going to ask you to leave. But uh, you're not going to probably upset me with your questions, <laughs> Logan. Hey, man. Don't come in here and hijack my life. You're at a roofing conference that you are clearly not invested in. <laughs> Coming in here, talking about you're my favorite. She's Marissa is in my life right now. All right. If you weren't at a roofing conference, maybe you could be live and she would be in yours. But she's here now. I'm not saying that, that I'm her favorite. I'm just saying that she's here now. She's not on your life. Logan is your favorite. That's all right. That's fair. He's my favorite too. Everybody's got to have a favorite. You got to pick one, one or the other. You know, sheeps and goats, heaven and hell. I get it. Saved and unsaved, regenerated and unregenerated. I, if you want to be that way, that's fine. You know, it is Logan though. I mean, you never know what you're going to get. You might be getting a sassy, you know, Texas lady. Or you might just get, you know, just Logan. You never know. So ghosts or demons? Uh, yeah, I don't know what ghosts are, man. I, I don't think that ghosts are spirits of the dead people or lady. Sorry, um, I don't know if I don't know if ghost goats. Yeah, I know what goats are. Um, I would be inclined to believe that ghosts are demonic. Um, especially if they're taking you oh, distracting you away from the Lord, uh, which is typically, I've never met a Christian ghost hunter. Let me just say that. I've never met a, a 
<laughs> like a a born again theologically doctrinally sound ghost hunter. Um, so I I think you know ghosts they they could be demonic apparitions. They could just be con- confusing scientific anomalies. Um, could be interference from static and radios. I mean, there's so much, but uh, I don't believe that they are disembodied souls that are hanging out, waiting to go to one place or the other. I don't think that the Bible teaches that. Outside of that, I don't know what they are. Everything I've read about it says ghosts are from Satan drawing people away. It could be. I, I mean, I think the whole UFO and alien thing is absolutely demonic. My personal thoughts. I mean, people are so desperate to to discover alien life to prove that we aren't the only people. Like, um, I think it's a very anti-God culty type thing. Hey, Jax, what's up? Imagine Ghost Hunter Grave Soaker. Yeah, well, that's Bethel Bethel's school of witches and wizards. <laughs> With unfinished business. Yeah, I don't believe they are. Doesn't the Bible say that there's a barrier between heaven and earth? Uh, not probably in that same sense. I'm not sure. I'd have to look it up with what you're talking about. Uh, you don't have to worry about COVID. You have to worry about getting shingles, right? No, that's the new, is that the new fear now? Shingles? They were pushing shingles about a year ago. So I ain't afraid of no ghost. (laughs) What's up, John? Uh, LOL. God is a cult. Yeah. Cool story, bro. I've had COVID like four times. I can't wait to number five. Looking forward to it. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> I have family that still is afraid of COVID. They're, they don't live out here with me, but. Um, yeah, I think uh, I, I definitely think UFOs are demonic. How can you have it more than once? Weird. I know it's like the flu or something. Now they're pushing uh, fear of the monkeypox. Yeah, but that's the new AIDS because only gay only gay people can get monkeypox. So that's how they control the gay population. Yeah, that's what they did with AIDS too. They don't. The government doesn't like you people. Not you people. I'm obviously the government doesn't like us people. They don't like any of us. So yeah, you know they're gonna just fear us, scare us with you know gay monkeypox and gay AIDS and shingles and COVID and. Until the day that we die, we'll just live in fear and always submit to to them. It's so demonic, man. It's just ridiculous. Uh, that's that's my feelings on it. We don't have to share the same feelings. If you are concerned about COVID, that's fine. I'm not. You got it four times. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's pretty fun. <laughs> Ninja COVID is the new thing. <laughs> Ninja code sneaks up on you. It gets you where you're not expecting it. it comes in from the from your roof. Drops in down on you. Oh, yeah. Florida? Yeah, Florida. So Florida doesn't have COVID. It never did. COVID doesn't exist in DeSantis land. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's the flu, guys. People die of the flu. People die of COVID. Uh, oh, well. You know? God has numbered all of all of our days. God knows the day that we were born and the day that we die. He's numbered those days. Whether we die from COVID or getting hit by a car, that is the day that God has chosen for you to die. So stop worrying about it. Anxiety will keep you from really experiencing grace and peace. Strange they told everyone in New York to drink the tap water, right? That's that's weird. I mean, I'm not a I'm a little bit of a conspiracy theorist. I like to read it. I don't believe it, especially because a lot of these conspiracy theorists, they use the Bible, but they're not Christians. They're not, they're not using the Bible to proclaim the gospel in Jesus's name. They're not doing that. That's what we use scripture for. We use scripture for building up of the saints and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, not for debunking government things or, or proving conspiracy theories. So that's the biggest problem that I have with most conspiracy theories is they're like, cause the Bible says this. And I'm like, well, so what does this Bible say about salvation? That's not important. Okay. Well then obviously we have very different views on what's important and what isn't. And Christ will absolutely be glorified the entire time. 
Tennessee doesn't have COVID either. East Tennessee doesn't. Yeah, like Missouri, we don't have COVID here, but St. Louis does. A little bit in Kansas City they do, but not where I'm at in Missouri. COVID doesn't exist here. I live in Florida. I see the smart grid infrastructure going in. DeSantis is not who he portrays. Uh, Who cares? I mean, really, who cares? Right? Like, I mean, just love Jesus. I'm not saying that. I'm I'm saying I don't care. I'll say I don't care. Um, You can care. That's fine. Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't care. (laughs) Nobody. Look, it. You know. Do you know the type of person it takes to be a politician? Like when you really think about it, what kind of person wants to be in charge and in control of things? What kind of person will go up, whether they're lying to protect you or lying to hurt you, they're lying to you. That's what politics is. They're lying to you. They're finding a way to spin it to their narrative to get done what they want to do. It's dishonest on all sides, Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, it's dishonesty. I'm not interested in dishonesty. I'm interested in the truth. The Bible says to worship God in spirit and in truth, and that's what I'm going to do. And those things that are false and dishonest, I'm going to I'm going to reject. I mean, most Americans have vastly misrepresented the Bible. Yeah, but most I mean, that's a that's a false equivalency. Being an American does not mean that you understand the Bible. Being an American does not mean that you're a Christian at all. I reject the notion. I absolutely reject the notion. I've always been conflicted about God numbering our days in years and we have free will that will determine. Well, John, that's the problem with free will now, isn't it? I, I, I do not believe in free will. I don't believe that the Bible teaches free will. I understand that that's a concept. I understand that that's what a lot of people believe. But I believe that free will is an idol. I believe that the only the only being in all of creation that has had a free will is God. That is God's will. That's why Jesus says, your will be done. We have free choices. We, we make choices in our day-to-day based on our nature. But we don't have a free will. Our will isn't free. It is either bound to the world or it is bound to Christ. We are a slave to sin and darkness or we are a slave to Jesus. But we aren't free. We are not our own masters. And I reject the I reject the notion of free will. I don't say that I'm not saying you have to. You can believe in free will, but free will presents a lot of problems when it comes to a sovereign God. Do I have to spread the gospel to go to heaven? No. No work that you do go, makes you go to heaven. Not absolutely not. If you are spreading the gospel, it is a result of the regeneration and change in your heart when God saves you. There is nothing that you can do to go to heaven. Not a thing. Tinfoil hat conspiracies are fun. Yep, absolutely. Take them with a grain of salt. My town has it, but we get the NYC druggies, so our numbers go up. Um, who am I booting? No, you're good, Kelsey. We got lots of mods in here now. We're full of mods. Uh, isn't that the one thing that makes humans humans? What, free will? No, not according to scripture. The scripture does not tell us. The scripture does not teach free will. The Bible doesn't teach free will. It it doesn't. It just it just doesn't. Why would God ask Eve not to eat the apple? He didn't ask her to do anything. He says, if you eat, or he actually says, when you eat of this apple or this fruits, he doesn't use that word apple. God says to Eve, when you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. That is what God said. And guess what? She ate of the fruit because God said, when you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. He didn't say don't eat of it. He didn't, or he did say don't eat of it. He didn't say if you eat of it. He said, when you eat of it, you will surely die. It's like a cruise ship. It's going where it's going, but you can do what you want on the ship. I like that. I mean, that's a good, that's a good way of saying it. You know, we're all moving in one direction. We're all moving in one way in time that God has, has in his foreknowledge set forth for us. Um, I know it feels like we have free choices. Like I can decide to open this up be like, ah, I think I'm thirsty. I'm going to have a drink of water. And then I have a drink of water and it is water. It's just a tea. Um, 
That's to, but to try to say that God didn't know that I was going to drink that water or that God didn't for ordain that I would drink the water in that moment. How do you know? How do you know one way or the other? I think it's arrogant to assume that God didn't know that I was going to do that. I think it's arrogant to assume that God didn't make me do that. I know you can get into a lot of very hairy ideas within free will, so it's not it's not an easy cut and dry situation. It'll make people angry to not believe we have free will. Yeah, it does. It makes people very angry. Usually when I hear free will, it's used in the context of we made a bad choice. Yeah. Thank you. But what does the Bible what does the Bible what does the Bible mean when it says cowards won't enter heaven? I don't you're gonna have to give me a verse, Jules. I don't uh I think you are misunderstanding what scripture says. Scissor Tail says, I was taught that free will is part of being created in the image of God. Uh yeah, we are created in the in, in the image of God for the purpose of subduing the earth, of joint reigning and ruling with God. Uh, I don't know what that looks like, but I know that I'm still in my fallen flesh and my flesh has a desire of its own. So I have to constantly repress that and put that to death. How are you defining free will? Yeah, I mean, you got to talk about definitions too. It's not easy. Free will is not an easy concept. I don't, I wouldn't say I'm a hard determinist. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I believe we are absolutely held accountable for our sin and our action, for sure. So I'm not a hard determinist, but I do think that our choices are made within our nature and our will is subjugated either to sin or to Christ, period. But it is not free. There is no mention of free will. We are either slaves of sin or we are slaves to Jesus. That's what the Bible says. That's in Scripture. Do you believe that we are in the end times or close to the end times? What's up? What's up, nephew? Um, we are, uh, I believe that we are in the millennial reign of Christ. I believe that we are in the end times ever since Jesus ascended to the throne to rule beside the father. We are in the millennial kingdom reign of Jesus. And we are going to get progressively more Christianized. That is a post-millennial view uh, which I am leaning far more towards than I am the amillennial view, which says that things are going to keep getting worse. Uh, but again, eschatology is one of those things that if I'm wrong, it doesn't really matter uh, because I believe that God is going to do what God wants to do. God bless you, bro. You are doing a great job explaining. Thanks, Jules. I appreciate that. Well, to God be the glory because you know I've had to work out a lot of questions on my own. I've had to I've had to go through these things here. Hang on a sec. I got to. Um, sorry, I had to put uh, I had to put my power saver on. My phone's about to die, and I don't have. Oh, I do have my charger. Hang on one second. <clears throat> let me get my let me get my charger plugged in so I can. Uh, I bought the splitter so I can talk and charge my phone at the same time. You guys are good. I need to let me know if my audio goes dead. One second. All right. Check in one, two. Do you hear me? Yes. Hear me? Do you hear me? Just making sure. Uh, pantheist is the, it's a joke. Pantheist. Okay, good. Pantheist is the idea that it'll all pan out in the end. That's the pantheist. So I believe, you know, at, at the end of the day, I believe that whatever the Lord says that he's going to do, he's going to do. And I don't think that we should get caught up in, uh, in worrying about what's going to happen at the end. You are alive. You are born for a time as this right now. You are born to serve and glorify God. So who cares what happens in the end? God's got it. Be one of his. Be on the side of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that you can do to, uh, to guarantee that you will not be destroyed in any calamity. Because we live, as Christians, we live in the already and not yet. I live eternally because of God's election, of his calling me and his, of his saving me. I live eternally. So you can take this body, like Paul says, but to live is Christ, to die is gain. 
who's guest who's requesting to come in? You guys, I'm not doing guest requests. I'm not doing guest requests. This I uh, I don't care about your beliefs, Lucy. And I don't care about insulting your beliefs when I'm speaking the truth of the word of God. Let me be, let me, let every man be a liar, but God be true. Uh, you can be offended and insulted all you want. That doesn't matter to me. And I'm sorry, but people need to know that. People need to be talked to in truth. Not, I'm not going to flowery, I'm not going to dance around your feelings. I'm not going to do that for anybody. Nobody should. We, I'm not, I'm not going to placate to people. It's ridiculous. I'm not going to placate. You're demanding your time of me. You are demanding my attention for a ridiculous notion. And I'm not going to placate to you. I'm, I'm not. If that's wrong, then, then God will show me and I'll, I'll work through that. But uh, I'm tired of being nice to everybody. I'm tired of being like, oh, well, I don't want to hurt your feelings. I don't want to offend you. No. The problem with where we are in this country is we're not, we're, we're afraid of hurting people's feelings. If you don't trust in Jesus, you are going to hell, period. I don't care if that offends you. I hope that that offense draws you to repentance to Jesus. It should offend you. The Bible says it will. It says the, the, the gospel is a stumbling block to those who are perishing. It offends you because you are dying and going to hell. You don't know God. You don't know the creator. Be offended. Be offended all the way out of my TikTok live. I don't care. Paul told Paul told people in Galatians that were trying to get the get the the new believers, the new converts uh in the church, they were trying to get them to start uh circumcising themselves again saying that they needed to keep the law. Paul said I'd ra- I'd I'd prefer that they would cut their own wangs off. <laughs> yeah, be offended, get mad and then go find out for yourself. I mean, geez, be offended and sit in it, whatever. I don't care. I get offended all the time about stuff and then I go find out. Like if I hear something that I don't like and I think that it's not true, then I go find out to make sure. I go out of my way to make sure. Did, guys, Paul uses profanity. In our little churchy, in our churchy evangelical world, evangelifish world, we're, we're afraid to say shit. Paul says it. He doesn't say sh- the English word, but he, he uses a profanity. He uses the word skybala. When he's talking about our, uh, oh, where is it? Let me, let me look it up now because I'm going to mistreat the word here oh. that's not biblical <laughs> that's not biblical I don't like it I don't like it because I've been taught wrong things. So I'm going to hold to my own views. Um, uh, let's see. It is in, I'm trying to find the, the verse. So give me a second. Uh, somebody can help me out here probably. Somebody help me out where Paul Paul uses uh dog on it. It's I found like half of it. It's where he's using the term dung. Uh Paul and dung Bible. I Probably chapter three of what? You have no proof, liar. What? Are you five? <laughs> no, don't don't block this person yet. Don't block this person yet. Hang on a second. Philippians 3.8. Thank you. 
Philippians 3, 8, it says, what, I, what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. That word for garbage is the Greek word skybalon, and it was a profanity. It was a Greek profanity to mean shit. Yes, exactly. Bullshit. That's what it meant, pure blood. That's exactly what it meant in Greek. You're right. So we're on the same page, bro. So they changed the Bible. No, they didn't change the Bible. They used a different word to evoke the same thing. They used a different word. They didn't change the Bible. There was no English back when the Bible was written, dude. There was no English. There was no Spanish. All right? They don't change the Bible. The The Bible is translated from the original manuscripts. And because our language in English is limited and sucks, we can't fully describe the words that are being used in Scripture. We can't fully describe in just using an English word what was actually meant in Scripture. So when they translated the word, they used garbage instead of saying shit. Oh, well. Life goes on. Oh my gosh, we're all unsaved. We're all dying, going to hell. Ah! I mean, geez louise, guys. Take a break. Like, breathe. Have have a have a moon pie. Try not to murder anybody. All right. Somebody asked a really good question. How do I surrender to Christ? Taylor Rands. Taylor Ans, do you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sin? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is sent from God as a sacrifice for your sin that will bring you to an eternal relationship with God the Father? That's how you surrender. That's it. You've surrendered. You have now become a slave to Christ. Now, how do you go from here? How do you proceed? This. Okay, you can block... You can block that five-year-old pure blood guy now, please. Block him completely. Block him from my live 100%. Um, this is how you submit to Jesus. Now that you have made the exclamation that Jesus Christ is your Lord, you submit to Christ by his scripture, by understanding and knowing what he has said, by knowing his commands, by knowing what Jesus explains, by reading the Old Testament and knowing the laws, by seeing the character of God throughout history, by reading the Psalms and reading the poetic ex expressions of a heart of God. What is Calvinism exactly? Well, Calvinism is just a, a theological view. It's not, it's not a different religion. You can be, you don't have to be a Calvinist to be a Christian. It's a theological view in which we see five specific tenets of the faith that are in Scripture. Number one, total depravity of man. That all that man, because of his sin nature, is completely depraved and nothing that he can do can please God. He can do no righteous works. His righteousness is filthy rags. All right? Uh, unconditional election. We believe that God chooses who to save by his own standards by his own desire. He he chooses who to save. And it's not based on any good works that you've done or any bad things that you've done. Hang on, Taylor. I'm going to keep answering your question. Let me finish this one. But God elects to salvation anybody that he chooses. All right. The second, the third one is limited atonement or uh, specific atonement, meaning that everybody that God saves, he definitely saves. All right, that his that his death on the cross was not for the entire world, but was for all who believe. Okay, that the blood that he shed was for all the believing. Um, the uh, so limited atonement, uh, irresistible grace. That when God elects you and calls you, that His grace and His love is irresistible, and you must serve Him out of a willingness of your own heart because He's changed your heart. So it's irresistible. You must follow Him. It's a compelling force that makes you want to follow him. 
And finally, the perseverance of the saints. That's the, the fifth of tulip is uh, that whoever God saves, he saves forever indefinitely. And that no one can take you out of God's hand. And that when he makes the promise to elect and save you, that promise is forever. And he won't change his mind. That Those are the five points of Calvinism. That's what makes me a Calvinist is because I, when I read scripture, I see all five of those played out in harmony in all of scripture. And that's the view. That's it. You don't have to believe that, right? You don't have to. to make, that's not what makes you saved, all right? I was, I, was a, I was not a Calvinist for a very long time before I became a Calvinist, and I was a Christian the whole time. All right. You are extremely self-righteous. Amen, sister, so am I. None of your works save you. Absolutely none of them. Your self-righteousness is an is, is, is exact result of your flesh nature and your sin. We are all self-righteous. We are saved by grace through what? Faith. Not of works. Self-righteousness is a work. Piety is a work. Humility is a work. We are not saved by those, and we are not unsaved by those. We are saved by grace through faith so that no one can boast. You have no ability to say, you, it is arrogant to say, God, you can't save me. And it's arrogant to say that, God, I chose you. It's arrogant to do both of those things. To proclaim that God couldn't save you because of the works that you've done or the sin that you've committed. It's arrogant to say that God can't save you. And it's arrogant to say that you saved yourself or that you had some part in your salvation. That's self-righteousness. When you cling to Jesus and you rest in the fact that he saved you in spite of yourself, the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, nothing that we did caused Jesus to die for us. Nothing that we do causes Jesus to save us. It is the calling and the election of God alone that saves us, period. All right, let me catch up. Uh, <clears throat> thus going to hell is determined by where you were born. That's, that's, well, it's determined by God. It's determined by God. You don't have any type of sovereign view of God, laceration. You have no, you have no concept of a holy God. You have, a, you have no concept of, of the God of the Bible and of Scripture. All you are doing is asserting your own feelings and thoughts, not based on any type of scriptural evidence, period. We must confess our sins. We get to confess our sins, Scotty. Confessing our sins does not save us. That's a work. We get to repent. We get to confess our sins. Confession of our sins and repentance is a result of a changed heart. That confession, that repentance does not save us. That would be a work, and that would make Scripture into a lie. We are saved by grace through faith and not of works. We get to confess. We get to repent. God grants us that. That is a gift of God. It is amazing. We are saved by a gift, a gift of God. Salvation is a gift from God. It doesn't work like when you tell your mom and dad what you want for Christmas. Well, I really want, I really want like a new iPad. Oh, I got a new iPad. I'm so glad I said something. That's not how God works. <laughs> I really want a Nintendo 64 for Christmas. Oh, look, I got a Nintendo 64. I'm so glad I said something. If I hadn't said something, I wouldn't have gotten it. No, your father knows you. God, the creator, knows your heart. He knows your mind. He knows your soul. He knows what you need before you know it. That's how it's a gift from God. I'm not, I'm not blasting you, bro. I'm just passionate. I love Jesus. And that wasn't towards you. That's to all the naysayers. How about that? <laughs> 
I get passionate, man. Yeah, it's true. That Peter uses repent and be baptized quite a bit, but Paul, uh, Paul doesn't. Paul's very clear that that uh, you know that that it, repentance comes as a natural progression of a changed heart. Hey, Melissa. So I've asked God to forgive me and take me in, but I feel like I'm being attacked, sort of. Of course you are. You are 100% being attacked. The Bible says in Ephesians to put on the whole armor of God so that you can stand against the attacks of the devil. Well, what is the whole armor of God? The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the feet, uh, the the sandals, uh, what is it, that prepare the gospel of peace? And the sword of the spirit. What's up, God child? The second that you do anything for God, you're going to be attacked. I remember when I got saved and I was like, oh man, Jesus is awesome. I went to bed one night. I was so excited. I was so on fire for the Lord. In the middle of the night, I woke up and it was like the devil whispered in my ear. He's like, what about dinosaurs? <laughs> I woke up in my rack in, in, on the ship. I woke up and I'm like, dinosaurs. God's not real because the Bible doesn't talk about dinosaurs. <laughs> like that was a demonic attack. I wasn't thinking about dinosaurs. Those type of things are, those are the fiery darts of the devil. They come all the time. Anytime that you are doing anything that is image bearing of God, that is righteous and holy. Anytime that you do something that is proclaiming the truth of scripture and the truth of God's kingship, Satan is mad and his demons are going to attack you. So how do you take up your cross? Get into your word and pray. Read scripture, read through the book of John, read through Ephesians, read through Galatians and pray. Put on worship music, stand against the enemy Paul doesn't say that you might stand when you put on the whole armor of God. He says that you may stand. You will stand when you put on the whole armor of God. Put it on. What's an alligator? A terrible dinosaur. (laughs) That sounds like a logical response to an existential question, right? (laughs) It was, dude. Like, look, Satan, I've been saved for 21 years. I've been in the word. I've been striving to work out my salvation with fear and trembling for 21 years. I've gotten it wrong a lot and I've gotten it right a little bit, but I continue. I continue in it. I know that my God will not allow Satan to overtake me. And if I die on this earth, I get to open my eyes to see Jesus. So who cares? Who cares? Attacks suck. Bad things suck. They're unfortunate. But the devil will use anything to try to get you to denounce and proclaim anything other than Christ as king. Satan has been at me since 10. I get good with God and then I've, since 10 years old. Well, you have to stay in the scripture, sister. I don't know where you I don't know your situation. You need to be in a body of believers. You need to be surrounded by people who will pray for you. You need to find someone to disciple and be discipled by someone else. You need to stay active in the word. You need to join in that community of other believers. And you need to actively pursue righteousness, pursue God in everything that it takes. If if you haven't fasted, then you need to fast. Kill your flesh, deny your flesh, stop eating for a week, only drink water. And every time that you get hungry, pray and ask the Lord to sustain you. There's so many different things that we can do as believers within the realm of our nature. (laughs) What do you call an alligator in a vest? An investigator. I love that. I'm going to tell that to my kids later. Did God, uh, did God create Satan knowing what he would do? Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah, no doubt. Satan was created to the glory of God. Everything that Satan does brings about God's glory. All things work together for good for those who love the Lord. For the rest of everybody, yeah, it seems bad. It seems pretty terrible what Satan's doing out there. But you know what? When you know who God is and you know that Satan works, Satan answers to God too, guys. 
There's nothing that Satan can do without, without God's giving him permission. You've been constantly hurt by believers. Well, believers aren't Jesus. So what? Take a stand. Say so what to those people. Say so what? Those believers aren't going to stand before a holy God on your behalf. They're not going to advocate for you. They're not going to say, no, 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 don't, don't, uh, don't send her to hell, whatever. They're not going to advocate for you. Jesus does. Who cares what other people say? Let God be true and every man be a liar. The Bible says that a fool hates correction, but a righteous, a wise person loves rebuke. Devil wants Christians, not the unsaved. That's a good point. The devil's not going to mess with somebody that's already on his side. I'm looking for new friends. Hi, all of you want to be friends. Of course, we're going to be your friend. If you are proclaiming Christ's kingship, you are automatically a friend. You are better than a friend. You are a sister or brother for all of you in Christ. We are going to spend eternity worshiping at the throne of Jesus. Sorry for my cat's butt. Dude, stop being gross. Get out of here. My last cross to pick up is rap. It's the only music I've known. You can listen to rap, dude. You can listen to rap. You can listen to whatever you want. There's 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 rap music. There's rock music. There's soft rock music that all glorifies God. It doesn't keep you from salvation. I just, you know, my personal thing is, look, Bible says, Paul says, all things are permissible, but not everything is edifying. Not everything is going to work towards your benefit to know Jesus better. But nothing is going to take you away from what God is doing. Okay? I listen to music, to secular music all the time. Sometimes I can hear redemption in secular music. Sometimes secular music can glorify God. They just don't know it. But I know who I'm glorifying when I think of it. Don't get caught up in the semantics of it, man. It's not worth it. Ugh. NF is a good M- NF is good. KB is really good. Um, there's a few others out there. Andy Maneo, I'm on the fence of. You know, he's all right. Uh, Lecrae, I I actually think Lecrae's gone pretty full woke. But NF is good. KB is is really I really like KB. Um, there's a uh, there's several others. Um, what's another good Christian rapper, Nolan? NF. Yeah, we already said enough. Oh, you did. Oh. Yeah. Dax is getting closer to God. I haven't heard of Dax. Kieran the Light, I think his name is. There's one. Uh, my actually, my son Nolan introduced me to Drakeford. D R A K D R A K E F O R D Drakeford. He's got a couple songs on Spotify. That's great. God is great. Beer is good. And people are crazy. That's right. <laughs> this has been refreshing and sharpened me today. Amen. Hey, let's, uh, let's close out in prayer guys. Cause I'm going to go take care of stuff around the house. Okay. I'm going to close this out in prayer. You can catch, you can watch this whole thing again on YouTube on the doctrines of rad YouTube channel. Uh, you can watch all of my other stuff also on that channel. I download it directly from uh, TikTok and post it on YouTube. And it's on the Doctrines of Rad under the playlist Drew's Vids. Um, so you can find it there or you can listen to the Doctrines of Rad podcast uh, there as well. So let's go ahead and uh, let's close out with a word of prayer. I'm going to pray specifically for 48-hour change. Uh, I'm going to pray that you get some Christian people in your life and that you uh, you really you can, you can stand against the... Uh, the fiery darts of the enemy. Okay. All right, let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for today. Lord, thank you for, uh, just illuminating your word. Thank you for the, the, the confidence that we can have as children that have been adopted into the family of God, the kingdom of God, that we are joint heirs, co-heirs with Christ. Lord God, that you have called us into, uh, into your plan in order to, to subdue and dominate the earth. We are to proclaim the truth of God to all the nations, and we are to live by upholding your holiness and your righteousness, God, and your justice and your mercy and your grace and your peace. Lord, I pray for my sister here that is just struggling to feel that she's feeling attacked. 
I pray for all against all attacks of the enemy, Lord. Help us, show us how we can put on the armor of God better. Show us where we are lacking, Lord. Show us in your word how to strengthen our armor and how to 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 wear it in in honor of you. Lord God, as as we go out into the evil day, the battlefield, that we hold up our shield of faith, Lord God, that the faith that you have put in us holds uh, and holds back all of the attacks of the enemy, and that the sword of the Spirit, Lord, that you have given us is is the only weapon that we have. The Word of God is the only weapon that we can use against the enemy, because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against spiritual forces in dark places, God. I pray for for the body, for unity in the body of believers, that those here would group around and have a group of people to keep them accountable, to lift them up, to edify them, to rebuke them when necessary, and to teach them in the ways of righteousness. Lord, that we would just continue to move on towards you in glory and honor. We love you, Jesus, so much. I thank you so much, God, for for any chance to do this, any chance to proclaim the goodness of who you are. Lord, I am blessed uh, and just feel so grateful for what you have done. Be with us for the rest of our week, Lord. Help us to glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. Love you guys so much. Have a great rest of your day. I, I really am praying for you. You can always message me with questions if you guys have those. Take care. God bless you.